I make name tags. We've amassed $70 million in revenue in making name tags and badges and promotional products. All right, seems easy enough. What questions do you have so far? Yeah, we design them. I'm giving you kind of a uh, rundown version of it. And the reason why is because I believe that there's plenty of opportunity in every industry to carve out a niche. I have the opportunity this semester to teach downstairs. In fact, I, don't th I hope I don't have any students in here. The class is at 2 o'clock. Any of my students in here? Okay, good. They're actually down there doing what's right. But I have an opportunity to teach venture capital due diligence. And it's been uh, eye-opening because everybody that wants to become an entrepreneur, they think that you have to create this new niche market. And while that may be true in some regards, sometimes we can just improve upon what's existing. And sometimes the people that are entrepreneurs out there, I find that they all have something in common. And that is they just blast through certain barriers that nobody else is willing to, to blast through. So. That being said, I'm going to take a little bit different approach. One, because we're here at BYU. Um, two, I get to use some scriptures and some um, different things that have helped me in life. And I want to talk about some life principles more than talking about my story. But it ties in directly because I've learned these things along the way. And what I find is what sets entrepreneurs apart is that they're relentless. They don't give up. And they have a goal in mind. Now let me put a spiritual twist on it, if I can. Because this is something that I believe strongly in. Let me run through this. You guys will agree with this along the way. Okay, I'm going to talk about the four hurdles to progress. Because I believe that we actually have this great divine light inside of us. I think everybody agrees with that, right? We're all children of God. We all learn that at a very young age, and we preach that, and we understand that. Okay, so therefore, if we all have this piece of deity inside of us, what's keeping us from actually taking it to the next level? What's keeping us from progressing? So I'm going to take a different approach in the regard that rather than teach you what things to do in life, I want to take the approach, get rid of these four things. If you get rid of these four things, these four hurdles, something happens inside. There's just this natural progression. You have this drive and desire that if you can get rid of these things, then you can move forward. So I call these hurdles, obstacles, excuses, deterrents, lame sauces. I don't know. That's just one of my words that I, it's a nice way to tell people that's really just an excuse. Proverbs. It's been around for a few thousand years. Okay, time tested. The slothful man saith, there is a lion in the way, there is a lion in the streets. Why would it say that? Why would the slothful man say that? Well, you walk outside your house, you see a little kitty cat crossing the street, and what do you say? There's a lion in the way. There's a lion in the streets. Right? We have a tendency to make problems much larger than they really are. We also know that where there is no vision, people perish. So let me approach that a little bit. Here's what typically happens. We go through this cycle. We have a goal. We have what we consider a vision. We have a prompting. We have the potential. And usually it comes in the form like this. And our prophet's a great example of this. That this prompting comes or this impression comes to your mind that says, you know, I really should. And then the prompting follows, right? Everybody's had that experience. You're sitting there pondering, you're sitting there thinking, you're maybe doing your scripture study, sitting there in church, sitting in this class, whatever it is, and the Spirit impresses upon your mind that says, you know, I really should do X, Y, or Z. So we look at it and say, great, sounds like a great prompting, and so now I'm going to put that as my potential or my goal. That becomes my goal. That's how I, I take it to the next level. But then something happens where we have a choice. We can either move forward and be quick to obey and quick to observe and move forward 100 miles an hour and do it. Or we have a tendency to put it through this natural filter, right? And those filter, this filter usually ends up in four different categories. So we look at the problem and we think to ourselves, boy, this is really far. 
this is something that's uh, really difficult to do. And we immediately begin to doubt. Okay? I appreciate Jeremy's prayer. I actually used him as the example for the stick figure right here. He did a great job being my model. Jeremy and I are in the same ward. So here you are at the bottom of your quest, and something happens along the way. You see these little dots right here? They're little tiny obstacles. They're little obstacles that Satan will put in your path or that your previous experience may put in your path. And you look at these obstacles, and you have a choice. You can either barrel through the obstacle, or you can let it weigh you down. And some of them, they'll weigh you down for a week, some for a month. And some people I talk to, and they're still stuck on it for 10 years. It's the simple obstacle in the way. Why? Because they forget. They forget, wait a minute, if I had this prompting, then there should be a way to accomplish the thing that the Lord has commanded me to do. As we get farther and farther along our path, we find that some of these obstacles get a little bit bigger before we finally reach our full potential. So let me talk about four of these things. I want to categorize these four things, these obstacles that we end up running into. First one is fear. I think it's the most important one because when we get rid of the other three, fear is the only thing that's left that's standing in the way of achieving our goal or the thing that we're supposed to do. Second one is blaming. Love that picture. Third one, complaining. That cell phone looks like it's about eight years old. And justification. For example, this young lady is justifying wearing immodest clothing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just want to throw that in there. So, so fear, what's the opposite of fear? Faith, right? Simple things. We talk about this all the time. If you're afraid of something or you have fear, what you've got to do is increase your faith, something we teach. Well, what happens? We have this ingrained fear of failure that's inside of us. It prevents us from taking risks. Where does it come from? It's an inherited behavior. It's pressure. A lot of it actually comes from World War II, World War I. What happened? What did we say to the troops? Get in there. You've got to succeed. You can't fail. What does grandpa always teach? You can't fail. What did mom and dad grow up teaching? You can't fail. What am I teaching? You can fail all you want. It doesn't really matter. Like, what's the big deal? Right? But we have this ingrained fear of failure. We're scared to fail. But we also know that risk is necessary for any type of progression or growth. And it requires trust in a correct principle or path from an authoritative source, right? That's why if you believe the scriptures to be true, you may exercise faith, you may follow a certain principle, you may test it, and then you have an experience that says, great, this works out, I've exercised my faith, I've actually gotten the reward back from it. Couple experiences from the scripture. One, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Simple enough, 2 Timothy 1 7. Doctrine and Covenants. This is what happened when Joseph Smith lost the 116 pages, right? He had a goal in mind, but then he decided to vary from it. Why? What happened? Come on, you guys got to know the. Give me something. He kept questioning. What did he, who was bugging him? Martin Harris. He was bugging him, right? Is that the Lord bugging him? No, it's a man bugging him. Pretty simple, right? So he gives him this, this counsel, and he says, Behold, you have been entrusted with these things, but how strict were your commandments? In other words, you were given a prompting. You were given an assignment. You knew what was in your mind, what you were supposed to do, and your commandments were pretty strict along the way. And remember also the promises which were made to you, right? So you get that prompt in your mind. You think, wait a minute. I'm feeling I need to move forward with this. What are some of the blessings associated with it, right? And then you end up, end up in daydream land. You think, wow, and then I could buy a house, and I could do this, and I could do this, okay? Those are some of those blessings that the Spirit will give us so that we can see what's going to happen, right? So Joseph Smith knew some of those blessings. So he says, remember also the promises which were made to you if you did not transgress them. And behold, how oft you have transgressed the commandments and the laws of God and have gone on in the persuasions of men. Right? So here's the prophet Joseph kind of getting in trouble a little bit because he had the assignment, 
He had the prompting. He knew what he was supposed to do. He ran it through that arm of the flesh, man filter, if you will. For behold, you should not have feared man more than God, although men set at naught the counsels of God and despised his words, yet you should have been faithful. And here's a cool promise. You follow these promptings as you're deciding what to do in your life, and he, meaning the Lord, would have extended his arm and supported you against what? All the fiery darts of the adversary, and he would have been with you in every time of trouble. Make sense? So again, going back, we've got the goal in sight. We start heading toward the goal. Satan gets in the way. There's a little discouragement. We start running it through our man filter. I call it that. That's where we decide, hey, this is what I want to do with life. This is what I want to figure out with life. But then we start asking friends and neighbors, start counseling with all these different people, start reading all these self-help books, start looking at everybody else's experience, and we forget that somewhere in there the Lord's telling us exactly what we need to do, what works for our life. Okay, the fear of man bringeth a snare. It's pretty straightforward. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Make sense? So oftentimes, we have a tendency to confuse things. So along the way, a couple things happened. One, I was kind of being prayerful. I knew I had to go to law school. I had three weeks to go. And uh, my wife and I were supposed to pack everything up. We started packing our apartment. And something just didn't sit right with me. Something just didn't feel right. And I sat there. I ran it through my man filter, if you will. I didn't know what it was at the time. I started asking everyone, and they said, what are you, nuts? And my family got together and had an intervention, right? I've never actually seen one in real life, but this was real. I always thought people were funny about it. My grandmother called, my aunt called, my parents called, everybody called and said, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know. I just feel like I should give this a shot. Like something inside of me is just telling me I've got to do this, right? And I was still young and understanding those promptings that were coming. But so I decided, you know what, I'm going to put off law school for one year. Seems simple enough, right? That was 11 years ago. I'm still putting it off every year. I joke with my wife. I actually have the acceptance letter in my office. I tell people, like, well, next year, if things don't work out, I'll go to law school. That'll be something fun to do. But what I found was I was suddenly alone in my idea. I didn't have the friends that were entrepreneurs. I didn't have the mentors that I needed. Suddenly, I was the crazy one. And my wife kind of looked at me and said, whatever, I'll give you a year. That works. We were newlyweds. didn't really matter. I mean, it didn't help that we were a couple months pregnant. She was a little nervous. Okay, common story. So who do we trust in? We've got a couple people that we trust in. You see kids, right? They'll jump off a bunk bed if they see mom and dad there. No big deal. If they see a stranger, what do they do? They turn and run, typically. You trust your doctor. I see that all the time. Well, maybe we ought to get a second opinion. Nah, don't worry about it. Just cut me open. I'm sure you'll find something in there. Religious leaders wanted to add some diversity. <laughs> it's fun to teach this at BYU because I realized, oh my gosh, modesty. I got the Pope in here. Like, we trust our hairstylist. Pretty simple. Those are little decisions that we just say, no big deal, and, uh, and we trust. One of my favorite things to hear is when I jump on a plane and people always say, fly safe. There's another trust example. There's absolutely nothing I can do once I've jumped on the plane that isn't going to get me arrested, right? I just have to sit there and deal with it for however long the flight is and hope that the 23-year-old that just graduated on this little tiny plane is going to get me to my destination safely. So we have all these trusts. But we don't realize that we trust them because, well, everybody else does. Well, entrepreneurs, how many of them are out there? Gosh, we're less than 1%, which means what? It's going to be hard to find fellow entrepreneurs that you trust. What are you going to find instead? You're going to find everybody else that says, don't do it. You're crazy. So the opposite of fear is faith. The next one, blaming and accountability. To be accountable, we take 100% ownership of our responsibilities, including the results. When the results are less than favorable, we begin to blame others or circumstances. Fair enough. Started from the very beginning. What happened? Cain blamed God. For what? He said, well, I killed my brother because 
thou didn't accept my offering. Right? Start at the very beginning. Something that's just human nature. So we begin. Pilate, what did he say? Wash my hands of this. I, I blame the people. They're the ones that are doing it. Even though he had the authority, he blamed the people. What do we blame? We blame circumstances on others. We blame government, economy, banks, boss, professors, teammates, traffic, weather, bishop, home teaching, companion, colleague, internet connection, computer. We find ourselves blaming everything. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to Thanksgiving dinner. What was everybody talking about? They were all blaming things on people, and you just don't realize it. You're sitting there saying, well, the reason why you didn't get the promotion, or the reason why you didn't get this, or the reason why you didn't get this. If you don't have anybody in your family like that, then you're probably the one that's doing the blaming at the dinner table. So there are plenty of people around us who agree with us, right? Why are we such a litigious society? Because I was driving down the road, and what happened? I knew I had bald tires. And I slid off the road. And who did I blame? I blamed the city. It didn't clear the roads well enough. I blamed the car manufacturer because they didn't tell me to change the tires. What happens? I get a couple million out of it. Lawsuits. Seems great, right? We're such a litigious society because we're scared. We're scared. And so we end up feeling so much better when we blame somebody else. Simple history. We find so much blaming in society that I hear this a lot at work. I'll say, hey, client called me personally. We messed up a $10,000 order. It's kind of a big deal. And they say, well, Brian, here's what happened. First, it got put in the computer wrong. Then it got sent out to the warehouse wrong. Then it got put into production wrong. And then it got printed wrong. And then it got cut wrong and trimmed wrong. And then it got shipped wrong. So that's what happened. Who took the accountability on that one? Nobody. Not one person. Right? And so in our organization, we're sort of against the passive voice. Right? Because passive voice is sort of neutral. Right? We have this fear of disclosure. And so we teach, I want to know who did this wrong. Because if I don't know who did this wrong, then I don't know when they did something right. Right? But we always know who did something right. Correct? Why is it that sports figures can't blame anyone? Well, because you have 20 million people viewing, and they know exactly what happened because they saw instant replay. Fair enough. But in our own lives, we have a tendency to sort of hide behind that. Oh, yeah, I don't know what happened, honey. I just I picked up your laptop, and it, it, it got dropped somehow, and that's just what happened. Right? We just have that tendency to use the passive voice. We use the you, they, he, she statements. My kids are notorious for this. I remember I walked downstairs one time. My son had this nice poster on the wall. It was ripped off the wall. One corner of it was still there. My three kids were, oh, they were probably seven, five, and four, the oldest three. And I said, hey, who ripped the poster? Right? Like a typical dad would, I guess. And they all looked at each other, and they started doing this game, right? Well, Lauren did this, and Katie did this, and this is... Because of this, I started playing this game. And I said, well, that's really too bad because I'd really like to know who did it because I'd like to congratulate them and give them a bowl of ice cream. And my second child, my daughter Lauren, said, wait a minute, I get a bowl of ice cream for tearing down the poster? And I said, yeah, that's what I'm offering. And she says, great, I did it. And my son, who I knew had done it, he's looking at it and he's like, dad, she's lying. Like, this isn't fair. But all of a sudden, there, there was this idea of, gee, I can get the truth out because the reward is what? It's something that we perceive to be good. When we perceive that the reward is bad, we start blaming. So how do we get around it? Start using active voice in your life. You'll hear what happens. You, everybody's had a roommate, right? Hey, I, I don't know what the, your plate got um, messed up. I'm sorry. Like, I, I, I don't know what happened, but it got something. Okay? We have a tendency to do that. And we walk in, and like, what are you talking about? I know exactly who did it. I, know, I can even tell what happened to it. Like, I don't know. It just it got dropped or it got messed up somehow. Okay? In our life, we're afraid of full disclosure. That's why athletes learn the hard way. They see everything. Right? All the fans view everything. Once it's recorded, you can go right back to it. We need transparency in our lives. We need more I statements 
Yep, I failed. It's pretty simple. Right? When we do that, we have a better influence on everybody else. Easy enough. Let me run through these. Here we go. You know these terms. Persuasion, gentleness, long-suffering. Those are hard to do. It's easier to blame somebody than to persuade them to do something. It's easier to get frustrated and justify your cause than it is to have gentleness. It's very easy to not have any long-suffering. Complaining, problem-solving. What do we know? Complaining gets you absolutely nowhere. You can either be a consumer in life or you can be a producer. Seems pretty simple. Do we understand the difference between the two? Who are consumers? Those that consume something. What are they? Takers. They take, right? They consume, right? The IRS, the federal government, right? They may be necessary, but they're takers, right? Who are the producers? They're entrepreneurs, they're people that give, they're people that are adding to something, right? Everybody knows this, okay? Think about your own family again. Who are the consumers and who are the producers in the family? You have those that take and take and take and take, and you have those that are constantly giving, constantly giving back. A complainer only detracts from a group and halts momentum, while a problem solver pushes things forward or pushes things in a forward motion again. Pretty simple, right? And thus my brethren did complain against me. This is Nephi talking, right? And they were, and were desirous that they might not labor, for they did not believe that I could build a ship. Neither would they believe that I was instructed of the Lord. I had a really similar experience, right? Hey, Mom, Dad, I have this great idea. I'm going to be a name tag maker, not an attorney. Okay? What did my parents say? They said, well, we're not going to help you. <laughs> they didn't want to labor. They didn't want to really pitch in. They loved me to death. Right? And I know this is being recorded, and I'll probably send them a copy of it, too. <laughs> but they did not believe that I could be a name tag maker, or that I could be a lanyard maker, or that I could make badge holders, right? They thought, what are you doing? I'm like, I, I, I don't know. I'm just believing that I was instructed of the Lord for my own personal life. Here we go. Then you have your own spouse sometimes, for she had supposed... This is uh, Lehi's wife. That we had perished in the wilderness, and she also had complained against my father, telling him that he was a visionary man. You're darn right he was a visionary man. It's exactly right. He picked up the vision. He understood the prompting, and he's like, you know what? We're going to move forward and go with it. And she says to him, Behold, thou hast led us forth from the land of our inheritance, and my sons are no more, and we perish in the wilderness. And after this manner of language had my mother complained against my father. It's not an easy path. Right? That's why we talk about stand for truth and righteousness. You may stand alone. You may be by yourself. Leadership is lonely. You hear all these things. You know these things. Right? Well, what is it? Well, it's following these promptings, these impressions that you might have. Stop complaining. Okay, complaining versus expression. It's really simple. Expression is necessary for progress, but it has to be coupled with suggestion for action not a big deal to walk in and say, hey, guess what? The cover to the microphone is sitting here on the floor. There's no action item, right? And everybody's thinking like, so? Well, I don't know what to do with it now. Do you know what to do? Any suggestions? Pick oh, pick it up. Yeah, good. See? Now I'm not necessarily complaining anymore. But here it is. It's been sitting there the whole time. Right? And it's been bugging me. I've been walking back, back and forth. and Okay, we've got to have expression and we've got to have action. Okay? It's okay to complain. It's not a bad deal. Because sometimes what we consider complaining is actually just laying out the facts. Right? Every Sunday morning, everybody gets up and what do they complain about? The sports loss from the day before. Right? Those that lost, they complain about it. Well, what's the action item? Nothing. Okay, so we're kind of taught in our society that it's okay to complain a little bit. But if we complain too much and we don't have any action behind it, it can absorb us, it can take us down. Okay, there's that pattern found in 2 Nephi 4, right? The Psalm of Nephi. He goes through, what's he doing? He's kind of complaining a little bit, having that moment, and then he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Awake my soul, no longer droop in sin. 
I can get out of this. I've got a plan of action. In fact, what I can do is, hey, let's move forward and we'll finish the temple and we'll do all these other things in the subsequent chapter. So he moves forward with some sort of action. My son wanted me to add the Rubik's Cube on there. And there's that one. So I told him I would do that. He, he's 10. Okay, justification. It's the fourth one. So we've got fear, blaming, complaining, and justification. Justification is based on the belief that I know best. Criminals justify that their needs, wants, ideas, time are more important than the law, right? We talked about being above the law in our venture capital class. And it was great because one of my students said, why don't we watch Sergio Flores, who's this sax man? Have you guys seen it? No takers? Some of you? Come on, give me something. Okay. You've seen this guy, right, playing, uh, what is it, Careless Whisper? Over and over and over again. And there's a part in there that says, well, he's above the law. And the law says, no, nobody was above the law. But we have this tendency to think that we're above the law. And the sad thing is, sometimes we think we're above God's laws. Where we say, well, I understand that he put this prompting in my mind. And I understand that I'm supposed to be obedient to it. But, but what? I'm scared. It's hard. It's difficult. It's this person's fault. See how these all tie in together? We start the blaming, the complaining, and the fear. Justification is based on a disrespect for authority. But when you have respect, it creates obedience and a sense of responsibility. Obedience to self, others, and God. We know and recognize that when a prompting comes and we follow it and we move forward and we're quick to observe and we observe with exactness, right? And we obey with exactness. We recognize that there's a blessing that's going to come. Pretty simple. Doctrine and Covenants section 50, verse 24 talks about he that receiveth light. So you receive that truth or you receive that prompting and you continue in God and continue within God, which means you're still going to move forward on the path. You're not going to run it through the man filter. You're not going to go through the, the flesh filter, whatever you want to call it. You're going to just go and say, you know what? I believe that I can actually do this. So that he that continueth in God receiveth more and more light. Right? And that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. That's the pattern that the Lord established. So again, when we talk about, well, so how do I get the business off the ground? How many of you guys have a business idea? Come on, don't be shy. There's a little bit of fear. So you know, maybe half the room. Half the room's got a business idea. Okay. I feel like the number one thing that keeps people from launching the business idea is what? Yeah, it's fear. It's fear. And if they say it's, well, no, not me. That's not mine. It's money. I'm like, go borrow the money. <laughs> Have you seen the interest? I can't. I, I know I'm not going to buy Well, no. How do I pay that? I mean, the debt, the everything. The, okay. Okay. It comes down to fear. Have you prayed about it? Do you feel good about it? Okay. What's keeping you from moving forward on it? Well, yeah, it's crazy. And there's this scripture that says this, and my parents say this, and I recognize that. But in your own personal relationship with the Lord, what does he say? How does he feel about it? What does he want you to do? How does he want you to do it? If you're going to obey and follow the Lord, remember the promise at the beginning? He's going to get rid of all the fiery darts of the adversary. In other words, he's going to clear the path for you. And he's going to get you out of trouble every single time. That's the pattern that he's established. Okay. What questions do you have? Oh, you guys are easy. Yes, sir. It's interesting you say that because Elder Nelson uh, came and talked to us and and uh, did a training for the bishops. And one of the things that he talked about is he said, if it's good, like this is a common question that people have. How do I know if it's the spirit or how do I know if it's just my mind? Elder Bednar even addressed this in his story of the uh, marks. Remember when he gave President Packer 20 marks? You guys have to uh, look at that story. Elder Bednar just thought it would be a good idea to give, when he was a missionary, a full-time missionary, he thought it would be a good idea to give the visiting authority 20 marks. He said he didn't really feel inspired to do it. He just thought, oh, you know what would be a good idea? Let me give you 20 marks. So he hands the general authority at the time, President Packer, 20 marks, right? And he later used it 
to uh, get them across the border and helped out in a number of things. But Elder Nelson said if it's good, that which is good comes from God. And so you move forward with it. And you begin to act and you move forward until you have such prompting that may say, you know what, let me just head to the right a little bit and let me head to the left. My pathway in life it's interesting because what I thought my path would be in life to achieve the things that I wanted and what the Lord told me that it would be were two completely different paths, right? I'd be just finishing my law school debt, I suppose, about now. I'd be maybe six years into a law firm. I'd be a junior partner, maybe a senior partner. I don't even know what that means. I just see that they are partners. And... Um, it's just a cool title, I guess, to make people feel good. But I'd be a partner at a law firm, and I'd bill 63 hours a week, and I'd go to lunch with fancy people, and I'd wear a suit every day. Sounds like a great life, right? I got a couple buddies that are attorneys, and they love it. And there's a part of me that says, ooh, that's what I thought I wanted to do. But it's not what the Lord had intended. It's not what the Lord wanted me to do specifically. Just like each one of you in here... You're moving forward on a particular path, and you have those questions. And you say, like, well, how am I supposed to move to the next level? What's the next step? Find them, because usually it's one of those four things that's going to keep you from taking that next step. When you get rid of those four things, you figure it out. Right, Jeremy? Easy enough? Okay. How's business? Good. It's getting there, right? Good. Okay. Yeah, two months ago, where were you at with it? Nothing, right? Okay. Then we talked. You start moving forward with things. You start paving the way. What happens? You start picking up clients. Great. How do you feel about it? Good, but there's you, still a little fear. Yeah, there's still a little fear. There's always fear, right? I even look at my own business. We, um, we have four factories in China. We have 850 employees in China right now. What a mess. And I say that in regard to, like, who wants to manage 850 Chinese employees? That's tough. And then I think about the 700,000 employees that are making all the Apple products. And I can't even wrap my head around that at the 85 facilities that make all the iPads and iPods and all the Apple stuff. 70, 700,000 people, 30,000 engineers that are working on Apple stuff. And I look at my tiny little problem, my 850 people over there, and I think, boy, this is, uh, this is easy stuff. Okay. Fire away. What else you got? Go ahead. What if you don't have an idea? <laughs> well, what's the purpose of the idea? Maybe the Lord doesn't intend for you to have an idea. <laughs> and I mean that in the sense that everybody says, um, well, Brian, does that mean that God wants us all to be entrepreneurs? Not necessarily, but what, is, what does he want? He wants us all to be leaders, right? That's part of becoming a God is developing leadership skills. And that can be done in, in various capacities. But again, I think that's a personal experience where you go through it and say, let me pray about it. I don't have an idea. But do you want to be an entrepreneur? Is that your desire? Great. Once you start networking and getting out there, you just find something. Usually the ideas come like this, right? When somebody, they usually drop a word that may not be appropriate because something happened. Like they dropped something, hit something, banged something, whatever, and the entrepreneurs and us step back and say, I think we ought to get a fix for that. Right? Seems easy enough. One of my um, ideas came on a cruise ship. We're sitting there. I was laughing every day. I was making fun of the announcements every day where the, the cruise director would say something to the effect of, well, we lost two more people today on the tours because we tried to find them. They didn't get back to the boat on time, so they'll have to meet us at the next port, right? And that's something that they always tell you, right? You got to get off the next port. If you don't get back on the ship on time, you have to meet at the next port. So the idea came, wait a minute, we do lanyards. GPS is kind of cool. So let's develop an idea to put these lanyards on all these 73-year-old people <laughs> that are hopping around. Because, I mean, when you think about it, as a, from a tour guide standpoint, this tour guide takes a hundred people, like a geriatric unit, they take a hundred people, take them to, to the middle of Italy or Tunisia or wherever it was. We were actually on a European cruise, and I'm thinking like, wow, how do they not lose these people? 
because I would lose all these older people, right? So I thought, just put a lanyard on, put a little unit in there, and the tour guide says it's time to go. You hit the button, lanyard buzzes, beeps, no big deal, everybody comes back together. If you lost them, you hit another button, boom, you pull up the GPS, grab the local data, you see exactly where they are because they're staring at that crystal something in a store somewhere nine blocks away. And they just lost track of time because we changed times on the boat. So then my wife and I were joking about it, like we keep losing people, and I thought, well, let's fix it. Let's figure out an idea. So the next day I just went and said, like, now what would mitigate this? Like how can we mitigate the risk? And then my wife says something like, you know what would be cool is I need to have your little tour guide thing for the kids because I can't find the kids right now. And I'm like, great. Throw some lanyards on some elementary school field trip kids. Let them run around the Bean Museum. Hit a button. Okay, kids, when it buzzes, everybody comes back to the dinosaur, right? So we're in the process of that. That's not something three months ago or six months ago I had no clue about. I didn't even know it was an idea. I didn't even think about it. I just thought, whatever. And what are we going to do? We're going to fill a five or six million dollar niche. Seems simple enough, but there's, there's so much out there that can be done. There's so much out there that can be done with improvement. So if you don't have an idea, just look around, right? Like comedians get all their material from everyday life. Entrepreneurs get their answers, and they try and solve everyday life's problems, right? Anybody that's uncomfortable in these chairs, you might be thinking, like, these really aren't that comfortable. Like, how do you sit in a chair like this? Well, that's how new chairs are born. Because there may be people like this or that or the other. Make sense? Or talk to me. i got hundreds of ideas. <laughs> but I had one back here. Uh, yeah, um, so how did you start out when you, all you had was this idea you wanted to make, make cash? How did you start out? Yeah, so here, okay. No exactly. So what I did is I started out basically as a broker. I basically said, like, let me go into a company. I went into an engraving company. I said, look, I'll help your website get to the top ten or whatever. And I just did all this research. I didn't really know much about SEO. I was reading every day, Lycos, Excite, Alta Vista, like some of these uh, sites that are now dead and, and gone. But I was sitting there like learning all the tricks of the trade. And I basically said, if I can get a sale through your website, then you give me X percent, right? I, I did nothing with manufacturing in the beginning. Had no idea. Well, it got to a point where I was building up the website enough they were getting enough traffic. It was a small engraving shop, and guess what? What did they say? Whoa, this is just too much work. You know what, Brian? This isn't going to work out. It's too much hassle, right? Too many orders coming in, right? And I look at that now, and I think, wait, what do you mean too many orders coming in, right? And some people, they just they don't get it. They're like, you know what? I'm happy where I'm at. I'm happy with what I've, I've dealt with right now. And so I took that concept and said, that's fine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start manufacturing it. And I can figure out a way to manufacture it faster because we have to. And my, my way of manufacturing faster was working until 2 o'clock in the morning. It wasn't necessarily faster. It's just that I didn't go home at 5 o'clock, right? And I remember there was uh, one particular time we had our son who was um, who's 11 now. He was, gosh, he was screaming for like, I don't know how long. I felt really bad about it. I still feel bad about it today because I was sitting there working, doing orders. I had my wife next to me. I'm like, we got to get this done. He kept crying, and I'm like, ah, like, why, Lord? Why do I have to choose between my crying child and these, you know, these things that I'm manufacturing? And you go through some of those processes, but then you kind of take it day by day and figure it out. I worked a lot of Saturdays, worked a lot of late nights. I just worked all the time, right? And then I realized, guess what? The Savior did the same thing. He's like, I, I work all the time, and my Father in Heaven, He works too. So we just work all the time. Jerusalem closes. Let's head over to the Americas and see what's going on over there, right? You just keep working <laughs> around the clock. Make sense? So that's what happened. You sort of uh, follow that pattern. But what I didn't do is I didn't really get into credit card debt like some people. I don't consider myself that crazy. I was talking to Spencer a little bit. Like, I'm just a numbers guy. Like, this makes sense. If I can get X number of clicks through on the website and I can get X number of people, then I can handle X number of orders and I can farm out X number of work. And in the very beginning, I was only making 8%, 9% margins because I wasn't manufacturing anything. But I didn't care because on a $100 job, 9 bucks was better than nothing at the time. And I thought, man, if I could just get 20 of these $9 jobs, wait a minute, and then I can get 20 of these $9 jobs in an hour, and all I'm doing is just feeding the orders through, and then I need to figure out how to feed the orders through faster, and then I need to figure out how to manufacture these. 
And that's how we started. And because we existed as a company, people just started finding us. And we just, this year finally, we're finally working on our outbound model. Like we have still, everybody finds us still. And it's crazy because everybody in this room says like, well, we don't even know what your company is. We've never even heard of it. And I'm like, I know, it's strange. But people find us on the internet. We have about 50 domains now that all feed back into the main company site. And we put everything under one umbrella and we manufacture everything or most of it in an 80,000 square foot facility in Springville. And so we've got 150 employees here. And we do, I was telling Spencer, we do between 120 to 150,000 pieces a day now. And it's actually kind of cool. Like you just see all the, the processes go through. And my wife still comes down and visits and says, hey, this is a cool way of doing it. Remember when? I'm like, yes, I do. And that's why we do it like this now. So when I started, it's, it's a typical story, but I, I consider myself a little different than other entrepreneurs because I still had a lot of fear in the process. Like Jeremy's saying, like, hey, I'm getting rolling. But I don't know what that fear, um, that's something I constantly struggle with. Like the next step, we're opening additional locations in the U.S. in the next year. Um, I'm stepping down as CEO. I'm moving to chairman of the board as of January 1st. So it gives me some time to work on strategy and establish some broader objectives and policies. Um, but in the beginning, like I was still, I was just a, a regular numbers guy. If the numbers work, let's do it. If they don't, then they don't. Make sense on certain ideas. What else? There's another one over here. I was going to ask, how do you spot a good idea from a bad one? <laughs> well, that's what's interesting. So as I was prayerful about things, you know, you get into section 61, and the Lord starts using this phrase, it mattereth not unto me. That was one as I was trying to answer that question. I was praying about, well, is this a, is this a good direction to take the company? And I feel like my response was, it mattereth not unto me. And then section 62 said the same thing. I don't care if they return two by two or all together, it mattereth not unto me. And then section 63 and 64 say the same thing. Let there be a craft bought or built, it mattereth not unto me. Right. So all of a sudden I realized the Lord didn't care what kind of cereal I ate in the morning as long as I followed certain correct principles. I've had some bad ideas along the way. I've had some things in the process that made sense numbers-wise, and I thought, well... Maybe this will work. There's got to be a reason for it. But um, in the end, I think it's just it's trial and error. You guys are learning the entrepreneurship skills that I didn't have access to 10 years ago, which is run it through the financial modeling, take a look at it. You can even use anybody else's money, which is kind of cool now, all the venture capital money that's out there. But I don't know if there's a, there's a, a, a simple formula for that. It's just a matter of doing your due diligence and digging in and deciding if it's a good idea. Okay, I think we got one more question. How much of your company do you still own, or did you <laughs> sell it off? I own 100%, the entire thing. And I, it's funny because I was talking to Spencer on the way up, and I said, I get to play this role of benevolent dictator a little bit because along the way we had people that wanted to buy us out. And again, those feelings were, gosh, it sure would be nice to take 5 or 10 or $15 million in funding. That sounds great, right? That's everyone's dream. But then those impressions came. That's not why you're doing this. I thought, darn it. Okay? Because I want to do this. So along the way, um, it may have been fiscally sound for us to take funding. Um, but what I typically would do is I would meet with the venture capital firms. I'd say, well, what are you guys going to do different than I'm going to do? Because I, I've got this partner that I pray to every night, and he keeps sending me all of these uh, things that I need to do. So my list is pretty big. What can you guys do? What can you offer on the table? And I'm not saying that VC firms can't do it. In fact, I started a venture capital firm four or five months ago to, to actually help do angel funding for a lot of different companies, to basically help them speed up the process. And I think VC money would have come in and helped us do things faster. That's really what it, it would have done. But we're at the point where we got, we got through the angel phase, the seed money, the Series A, Series B, um, we're heading. I mean, we do about 20 million a year in revenue right now, and and, um, and you know we're we're on target to take that to 50 million in 2013, and so we've kind of passed a tipping point in a sense. And I think the VC firm would have gotten us there in maybe 07 or 08. Okay. Well, thanks you guys. I know the class is um, over, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have.